In the early 1950s, the world was at the dawn of the Cold War. But there was a secret technology the Germans had been using to build their airplanes during World War II, making them lighter, faster, not to mention quicker and cheaper to build. And now after the war, the Soviets took the best parts of the German technology back to Russia, giving them an edge over the U.S. The U.S., realizing it was now behind, kicked off a program to catch up. And this program would become an engineering and manufacturing triumph, building the world's largest iron giants. These huge machines have made incalculable contributions to global society, commerce, space travel, national security, and your life too. During World War II, when the Allies examined shot down German planes, they noticed something disturbing. The planes contained parts which were far more advanced than anything the Allies had. These parts were huge forgings, basically large pieces of metal which had been squeezed under tremendous pressure in a press sort of like a gigantic waffle iron. These large forgings were stronger, lighter, and took far, far less time to produce than the methods the Allies were using, which partially explained how the Germans were making so many planes which performed so well. The Germans could quickly stamp out these huge, complex forgings. But the U.S. would have to make many parts, consuming hundreds of hours of personnel and machining time, and they still would not be as light or stiff. After World War II, America brought back three large German presses as war reparations, a 5,000 and two 15,000 ton presses. But the Russians made off of the biggest and best one, a 30,000 ton press, and the plans for a monster of over 50,000 tons, and that was a huge concern. Knowing there was a gap, in the early 1950s, just as the Cold War was starting to ramp up, the U.S. kicked off what is known as the Heavy Press Program. This funded an effort to build several very large closed die and extrusion presses in the U.S., but also to make sure we had the biggest presses in the world. But shortly after the program started, the Korean War broke out and American industry was urgently put into action to make war material. Thus, as to not delay the program needlessly, Parts were ordered from abroad, and before too long, the U.S. had its first press built under the program, though there were very much larger ones to come. Now, why Germany had this technology is interesting as well, and sort of the fault of the countries which defeated her in World War I. The Treaty of Versailles forced Germany to give up much of its iron-producing regions, but was allowed to keep its large magnesium reserves. If you strike iron like a blacksmith, it bends. If you try that with lightweight and strong but potentially brittle magnesium, it'll crack. You can't work it by hammering, so Germany was forced to invent the forging technology the giant presses offered, which turned to work out so beautifully with aluminum too, and it was later perfect for war applications. All of the presses that would be built under the heavy press program would come in two flavors. One is the waffle iron kind, called a closed die press. This is where you have a die into which you put hot metal which is stamped into place. The other is what is called an extrusion press. You may have had something like one of these as a kid. You place the shape you want in front of something you can squeeze and you get the shape you want. The pieces that come out are often somewhat distorted from the final shape, so they are heated again and stretched which makes them very straight with good dimensional accuracy. This is not to say that powerful presses were unknown before the German ones were discovered. In fact, they've been around for over a hundred years, but in much smaller forms and doing a different kind of job for smaller parts. England's James Nasmith invented the steam hammer in 1839, which forged heavy iron with incredibly powerful blows, and soon this kind of technology was used all throughout industry. But this is what is meant by open die forging, in that the metal is bashed between two flat plates, like in this remarkable footage from the Westinghouse works circa 1900. This kind of press imparts no particular form on the metal, and in the end, the shape is up to the skill of the team working it. Working metal like this has the advantage of changing the internal grain structure to give a much stronger result than, say, casting or even a machined part. It can also be much faster and produce much less waste, at the cost of having to have a huge capital expense to build the forge, furnaces, and all the other supporting equipment. In building the huge die presses, a gigantic foundation needed to be poured for them. You only see about half of the actual height of the press above ground. The rest is all foundation, which has to sit directly on bedrock. Most of the 10 presses built by the heavy press program survive and are still working today. The two biggest ones, both 50,000 tons are still pressing parts, even though they were first put into service in the mid-1950s. One of the two 50,000 ton presses was built by Mesta and installed in Cleveland. Mesta was an American company which today is not well known but is an important part of our ultra-heavy industry story. Started in the late 1800s, 
It went on to build giant machines for factories all over the world, including over 500 steel mills worldwide. During World War II, it made the giant 16-inch guns you've seen on battleships. Some of the largest machines ever built in America were made by Mesta, and the 50, as the 50,000-ton press is known, is one of them. Mesta was a company used to making huge machines, but the 50,000-ton press was so big Mesta had to make special machine tools just to machine some of the huge parts. There also had to be custom train cars and other specialized equipment for the massive castings. First operational 1955, the Mesta 50 has an amazing pedigree. It has forged parts for spaceships that put humans on the moon, the space shuttle, missiles, helicopters, tanks, and gas turbines. Every manned U.S. military aircraft had parts forged in it. Essentially, these huge presses made much of the advanced Cold War military machinery possible and had been a key component of national security. There's no way we'd have such advanced aircraft with amazing capabilities without these presses. When you think of the Cold War, you think of fighter and bomber jets, nuclear missiles, spaceships. Just take a moment to realize that all of those were made in part on these giant machines. But it doesn't stop with military applications. If you've ever flown on a commercial airplane made by Boeing or Airbus, you have directly encountered the magic of Mestas 50, possibly just inches from where you are sitting. If you've ever watched the wings gently bounce and wonder why they can flex but remain intact with such great sturdiness, or wonder why the landing gear can take such crazy forces on landing, thank the great strength of the forgings from the Mesta 50. But also think of all the secondary effects of having airplanes which are cheaper and faster. Think of all the global commerce which happens via aircraft. The entire world moves at a faster pace and more cheaply thanks to the amazing aircraft made possible by these large presses, moving packages, equipment, and people all around the world. You come in contact every day with objects which are in some way touched by these commercial aircraft. But let's not forget, these giant presses just don't do everything on their own. In fact, the entire process takes a huge set of machines and highly trained people as part of the process. Each press needs a plant of about six city blocks in size to fully support the entire chain of operations. First, the ingots have to be heated. Throughout the entire process, they may be heated several times as a part may be pressed more than once. Each time in a die which gets closer to the final shape, as to not impart too much stress at once. Before the part itself is pressed, tremendous pressures have to be built up by pumps and accumulators, which generate pressures eventually about 4,500 PSI. In the case of the closed die press, once the ingot is hot enough, it's put into place and finally the incredible force of the press is put into motion. Despite the gigantic forces involved, the operator has surprisingly fine control over exactly how much force is applied. Once out of the press, the parts are inspected. It may be heated again and later put into a slightly different die to refine its shape even more. Eventually, they are machined, though this process is designed to radically reduce the amount of post-pressing machining needed. But it's important to also think beyond the machines themselves to the entire chain between design and final product. Designs for products had to change because of the availability of these presses. Engineers could now make parts they'd only dreamed of before, and had to rethink how to approach problems. Appropriate metal alloys had to be created, and a process for certification, and new material science was born around the fantastic pressures involved. Once a part was made, because they would often go into extreme environments, new ways of certifying that a part were okay were developed, like advanced ways for looking for cracks or internal voids. I love how you can see these machines tracing a simple wooden form to control a giant milling machine to bring the part into final tolerance. To be able to withstand such incredibly high forces, it is necessary that the dies, that is to say the pieces of metal which come together to determine the shape, had to be carefully made of very hard materials. Some of the earliest NC, or numerical control machines, were used to make these dies. Today we use computer numerical control machines, or CNC, to make parts like these. But in these very early days, the controls were far more simple and had no computer involved, but instead were fed instructions from tape or even punched paper. I don't usually like to throw a lot of numbers at viewers, but here it's justified because of all the presses in the heavy press program, the Mesta 50 and its sister are just staggering. Now, just talking about the Mesta 50, some of the individual castings are over 350 tons. The entire moving crosshead part is eight castings at 1,150 tons. 
The eight single-piece steel columns which support the structure are almost 80 feet long, 40 inches wide, and come in at about 270 tons each. Four sections of each column are threaded with giant nuts on them. All are 52 inches across and can weigh up to 55 tons for just the nut. Very large 1,500 horsepower motors pressurized huge forged accumulator bottles to a pressure of 4,500 psi, which feed eight huge pistons, each of them 60 inches in diameter, at the top of the press for a total of 50,000 tons, or 100 million pounds of pressure. To give you an idea of that kind of pressure, if you placed a metal ingot on the entire die size, 12 by 26 feet, it would take 612 vertical feet of solid steel, about the same size as a 47-story building, to make that 50,000 tons of pressure. But here's what really blows my mind. All of the engineering that went into these presses was done with slide rules and engineers guessing how these never-before-seen forces would work. The sciences of fracture mechanics or finite element analysis didn't exist. And again, this was all figured out with pencils and manual mathematics. And yet the Mesta 50 continued to work beautifully for over 50 years. But finally in 2008, stress cracks were found in the Mesta 50. The foundations were cracked and was needed repair. When you consider the tremendous forces involved, I'm impressed it did as well as it did for nearly 60 years. It took several years and $100 million, but in 2012 I'm happy to say it was back up and stamping, and supports about 1,000 jobs in the Cleveland area. Both of America's 50,000-ton presses are so important. In the early 1980s, they were recognized as a National Historic Mechanical Engineering landmark. Sadly, due to the sensitive kind of work they do, you just can't go and take a tour. For a long time, America had the world's largest presses, but the massive 50s have since been passed by other countries. France at 65,000 tons, Russia at 75,000 tons, and as of a few years ago, China has put into service a huge 80,000-ton press of Russian design. Does this mean the U.S. is at a disadvantage? I'm not so sure. I found a report prepared for the Army on the use cases for building larger presses in the 80,000 to the mind-numbing 200,000-ton range, and the conclusion was that there just wasn't simply the need. The two 50,000-ton presses and the many 30,000-ton or smaller presses were enough for our needs. The next time you're on an airplane, Take a moment to appreciate what these amazing iron giants have done for us. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.